So Gilgamesh, <laughs> let us thrill Gilgamesh. time we watched season eight episode three the mole people but first some follow-up initially uh we reported that bill w is credited throughout frank conniff's run on mystery science theater 3000 this like all the best truths is a half truth uh (laughs) as he's credited only in seasons two and three also we finally watched rock and roll nightmare Yay! That was super fun. In case you forget, Rock and Roll Nightmare was also uh, written, directed, produced, and acted by Thor of Zombie Nightmare. Well, he didn't direct it. It was uh, directed by the guy who directed Zombie Nightmare, oh, okay. John Fasano. They've never completed their Nightmare trilogy. I, <laughs> I mean, we've had Rock and Roll. We've had Zombie. I, I, I don't know what the third one would be, but given this timeline when they would have started in the mid to late 80s i'm gonna th- say video game nightmare <laughs> i'm thor i'm trapped in a video game <laughs> it was it was great like it's terrible it's yeah it's really bad but it would be if it didn't have so many boobs and sex in it i think it would be a perfect misty opportunity <laughs> it was fun for the whole family <laughs> i mean you know kids there's nothing remotely erotic about the boobs or phallic puppets that ooze uh Mm -hmm. in it nothing that kids would pick up on that's subtle stuff for the adults there's a lot of grinding in that movie (laughs) yes and also it's a bit of a grind to watch to be honest (laughs) especially with that go nowhere subplot of where did the van go let's talk about where the van went hey did we have a van actually you're all figments in the imagination of an angel (laughs) but that we accept the challenge bit that's probably my favorite moment in any movie (laughs) it's it's pretty amazing but it's it's also admittedly it was completely unexpected because that (laughs) twist makes no sense at all yeah like all the best twists i'd like to think that this was uh, from the uh, unproduced pile in rod serling's old home he out shamalan m night (laughs) shamalan that is very true that's why i uh, i had no interest in seeing the visit or uh, that movie in which professor x is a bunch of different people because my god i've seen rock and roll nightmare if you could top that i'm interested and only then but that's not the only thing that we have to talk about, uh, because, Beth, you, you, you finally joined me in the realm of what I like to call pod whoring. <laughs> Indeed. I'm up to, uh, t- what is his name? I want to say Pod F. Tompkins, but that's not right. Paul. So, yeah, sorry. The, his uh, podcast was the Pod F. Tomcast. Yes, which had its moments. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm getting to Paul F. Tompkins' levels of podcast whoring, and, and that I've done two other ones now. Mm-hmm. And one set to come out soon. Indeed. Uh, this is your mixtape with friend of the show, Michael. And uh, just for the listeners, what will you be doing on This Is Your Mixtape, just in case they have never listened to the program? Exposing way too much of myself. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Uh, I'll be talking about five songs that were meaningful to me at different points in my life. It's just an interesting way to consider how music affects us and how it reflects our outlook on lives at different moments. And uh, there's a lot of Bjork in it. Bjork. Um, I, I do love Bjork. Um, <laughs> well, this, this is good. Now now you are embracing uh, your own Paul F. Tompkins. I mean, you're a tall woman who's easily prompted. You're a tall F. Tompkins. You're going to be great on podcasts. <laughs> But that's not the only uh, exciting announcement uh, that we have to make. So This Is Your Mixtape is part of the Megaphonic Network, which is also what we're a part of and our founders of, basically. Indeed. And we've been going for roughly a year. So we are going to be having a a couple of events to mark off our first anniversary. First of all, if you go to the website, it's just a show.com slash survey. You can take a three-question survey about It's Just a Show, uh, get us a sense of what you've responded to the most, and give us a sense about what we should be doing for this next year. So essentially, we want to know what your favorite episode, not only of this program was, but of the 24 episodes that we looked at of MST3K, which of those you liked the most, as well as a secret sexy bonus question that I won't talk about on air. But yeah, we want to hear from you. So go to that website. 
Uh, along that line, if you, especially if you happen to be in Toronto, we are going to be having a party. Ooh. So if you go to megaphonic.fm slash party, you can get details on the party that we're going to be starting on Saturday, March 24th in Toronto. It's going to be really fun. We're going to be uh, introducing a couple of new shows that we're really excited about. There's going to be food and drinks. Uh, you'll get to meet us if you want to see what we look like in person, our hideous faces. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. It'll be a great big night. That's right. Uh, also, uh, opening for us will be the Newfoundland band Great Big Night. <laughs> they play songs only about the Stanley Tucci film Big Night in the traditional Newfoundland Italian style. <laughs> Dante, what's his name of the other fellers, will also be there. Now, Beth, you and I are not social butterflies. So I, I-, I propose this. Let's see who can uh, consume more food and booze until we have to like physically be, be taken away from the party. <laughs> This time we watched season eight, episode three, The Mole People. So here it is, another universal monster flick. This one begins with an introduction by real life English professor, Dr. Frank Baxter, who describes a whole bunch of hollow earth theories that have existed throughout the modern era and explains that this movie is a fictionalized representation of one of those theories. Sadly, we must bid adieu to the kindly Dr. Baxter and turn our attentions to the pompous Dr. Roger Bentley, played by the always uncharming John Agar. He and his entourage of archaeologists accidentally uncover evidence of an ancient Sumerian civilization in a dig, and, working from the instructions on a tablet, ascend to the top of a nearby mountain for further clues. Some not uninteresting climbing footage ensues, but that's not what butters this movie's bread, so we're quickly spelunking into the depths of an underground cavern where our heroes uncover a vast pre-modern civilization, an entire city built inside the mountain. It's so monumental a discovery that the intrepid scientists decide to take a nap. And while snoozing, they're kidnapped by bug-eyed mole people. Are these the descendants of the ancient Ishtar-worshipping civilization? Uh, maybe? but mainly they're mushroom-harvesting slaves of a bunch of -of plaster-of-Paris-faced humans. Their ancestors fled to the caves after the ancient flood, which caused them to really double down on the whole worship of Ishtar thing. They even sacrificed their own citizens to the so-called Eye of Ishtar, a chamber in which the Chosen are burnt to a crisp. Bentley and his friends manage to make nice with the king, who believes they are messengers of the goddess because of their powerful light magic, i.e. their flashlights. While enjoying the king's feast, Bentley eyes a normal blonde white lady, a servant named Adad, or Adele, whichever one you want, who is disdained by her society for having the mark of darkness. Oh, the irony. Anywho, Alinu, the high priest, figures out the archaeologists are not gods when one of them is killed by a mole person, and he attempts to swipe their magical flashlights. Some stuff happens. Bentley and friend free some imprisoned mole people, which starts an uprising. The two archaeologists and Adad are forced into the chamber of the Eye of Ishtar, just as the mole people take over. And hey, the light is just natural light. So our normal white-skinned humans are just fine. They all climb to the surface, where Adad immediately dies in an earthquake. The end. All right, and I have some ancient Sumerians to discuss of my own, for I have a summary of an ancient TV show that aired in the late 90s. <clears throat> In the prologue, Crow pretends to be a space child with flashing eyes he got from a novelty store. The ruse fools no one, despite the eyes making a spooky theremin noise. Also, Crow seems to remember Mike, just as he did in the Prairie Vac sketch from the previous episode. More on that later. Back in Deep Ape, Bobo is irritated because it's Lawgiver Days, a made-up holiday by Pearl for Pearl. Pearl catches him ranting about it to Peanut, and, for his insolence, Bobo begs to be killed. Groveling's good enough for Pearl, so the ape scientist is off the hook. On the satellite of love, Tom and Crow made some treats for the Lawgiver Day's bake sale. Mike's sad no one told him about it, but shrugs it off and purchases a slice of Crow's mile-high meringue pie. It's literally a mile high. Crow reluctantly makes his way to the top, only to fall off. In segment two, Mike is on the Hexfield view screen, pretending to be the professor at the beginning of the experiment. Crow and Servo don't go along with the bit and berate him for not being funny. Mike has an outburst about not getting to have any fun and being excluded from the bake sale, but he hugs it out with Servo and apologizes to Crow. 
An acoustic guitar is whipped out for segment three. Fortunately, no one plays Wonderwall. Whew. Instead, Tom tries to serenade Gypsy Mike and Crow with an acoustic ballad about what he's been up to after he turned into a ball of pure light at the end of season seven, but his guitar is out of tune. A string breaks during the ballad, and it almost blinds Mike. If only Tom heeded Gypsy's advice and kept an orange in his guitar. Crow has something of a psychological breakthrough in segment four. Crow tries to convince Mike and Servo that a Polaroid selfie he took, among other things, is evidence that another Crow or Crows existed. Crow is eventually convinced by Mike that he was on the ship for 500 years alone, ate too many chocolate bars, didn't wash his face, and has nothing to show for his semi-millennium lost weekend but a weird fertility doll he made. His Mike-specific amnesia has now lifted. In the final segment, Crow mentions the possibility of ancient civilizations aboard the SOL. Sure enough, Mike finds some particularly whiny mole people under a floor panel and chases them off with a flashlight. In Deep Ape, Pearl wins Miss Lawgiver for the 32nd annual Lawgiver Days, so it's time for cake. Beefcake, that is, as the apes present her with a smiling hunk named Howard. We we have now completed the latest installment of the early days of the sci-fi era and its retooling for the network. Beth, what did you think of this episode? Uh, it might be because the bar has been set pretty low over the last couple episodes, mm-hmm. but I like this episode. This was a this was a solid B, maybe even a B plus in some circumstances. While I like, while I wouldn't go that uh, high, I have to say, like, I was pleasantly surprised by this episode. If, if we're if we're giving grade ranks, I guess I would give this a hearty C plus, mm-hmm. which is still a pass in every household. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, while it's not going to be a favorite of mine i think ever it like it's funny Mm -hmm. and i had no memory of this one i had like fond memories of both leech woman and revenge of the creature so when those two episodes turned out to be i thought kind of lackluster i had no idea what to think this would be and i have to say i like i ended up enjoying myself uh the riffing is good i like the concept of lawgiver days (laughs) and you know crow's flashing eyes are pretty neat so if mst3k is on and you're well familiar with it, this wouldn't be your first episode, (laughs) and you have nothing better to do, this would be a totally fine episode to watch. Even the segments, which are often, uh, we find at least, sometimes the weakest part of the sci-fi era, they were pretty cute. I I laughed at the Mile High Meringue Pie. Uh, I liked the bit with the guitar not being able to be tuned properly. I thought the third segment, where Mike pretends to be the professor, to be oddly meta, do you think this is one of the, another one of those moments where they were trying to state definitively that this was no longer following like the Comedy Central formula of things? Because that is exactly what they would do: is have somebody dress up as somebody from the show and just kind of satirize. And they're very much against that this time. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that if you're going to to be meta, it has to be entertaining. Also, like I hated that sketch. Yeah, that was the weakest sketch by far. And it's also hard not to be on Mike's side for how uh, much he gets pilloried because one, the English professor in this movie is adorable and highly imitable. He's amazing. <laughs> he rules. So <laughs> Mike's obsession with him makes me like him all the more, and makes me really dislike Tom and Crow for shitting on him. And secondly, I I had a, a really weird random experience which triggered uh, this uh, sighting uh, or lack of sighting of Bill W. in the credits. I watched The Giant Gila Monster, oh. which is just a episode from the Joel era that I never saw. And it was on Netflix. And, of course, the Netflix episodes are changing as of March 15th. Right. So I thought, oh, I should give this a whirl while it's on. And there's, like, this exact same sketch shows up. Really? This exact same sketch shows up. But there it's funny. Hmm. And it, it's... It's because Joel comes across as a lot more bullying <laughs> in it, which is why the back and forth is a lot more funny. And it also ends with uh, Gypsy breaking things up by, like, kamikaze attacking people <laughs> with her giant face. I'll have to ch- check that one out. Yeah, do it while there's still time, March 15th. Okay. Uh, also, there was genuinely a very strong sequence uh, during the riffs that I, I would tell people to stay tuned for. And that was the way they absolutely riffed apart the interpretive dancer, which you get <laughs> right before the end. We've discussed how sometimes they just seem to be mean for the sake of mean. And, and that can be that can be a little off-putting. But this is just like, this dance totally deserved everything that it got. And they just opened the hatches on this. How would I describe it? How would you describe it? She, I think the movie was trying to go for like a Salome erotic Eastern dance, but mm-hmm. kind of cross with 
Bob Fosse or something like that. Anyway, it's really bad. Yeah, it plays a bit more like I've got no strings. <laughs> yeah. Wonk, wonk, wonk. Yeah. <laughs> She just plods around, like, I'm not saying the dancer isn't good, but I just feel like somebody's just like, just preform it. This is the Jerry Garcia guitar solo of Liturgical Dance. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of really good riffs in this episode. And what I found from the last two is that there'd be a line here and there, but for the most part, I was watching the movie and then just getting distracted and be like, ah, that's Kevin Murphy. Oh, right. I'm watching Mystery Science Theater 3000 and I would forget. Whereas with this episode, like, I think there's a number of solid riffs, but I think my favorite part was just early on where they're talking back to the, not even the narrator, the presenter for this film, uh, the aforementioned adorable English professor, Frank C. Baxter, as he's talking about this. And the gem line of the episode, and one that got featured in a lot of ads, was, uh, this is more than just a story told. It's a story botched. <laughs> I have to say, like, I really think that uh, something of note to Die Hard Misties, if you haven't seen this episode in a while, I think it's worth a look, because I think Bill Corbett's really coming into his own as Crow here like as of right here he's really gelling with the cast more than he did in the other two episodes like he's fine before uh and in fact i am totally on board with uh the wonkier crow that you see in like the the segments in 801 just because what he described as crow with a stroke is really adorable to watch (laughs) but that also one of my favorite lines is his in this episode it's when all of the uh, archaeologists are walking off to the distance and there's just a moment of silence i don't even think there's score uh on the soundtrack and uh his corbett who chimes in with uh savor the precious moment where john agar isn't talking <laughs> And the movie itself is not great, but there were some moments that really stuck out to me as being inventive. Adam, as someone who knows a little something about special effects, how did they do the mole people burrow thing where they actually can pull people into like a a big ant hole? I thought that was really well done. Uh, Essentially, like I think what we're looking at here, because this was an extremely low budget movie. uh, So I'm pretty sure they're using the equivalent of movie snow. Mm. of fake snow to be like driven in uh uh, like they're able to pull in the actors that way but it's a neat effect and i have to say while the mole people are not as fondly remembered as say your creatures or your uh, karloff frankenstein monsters and whatnot i think they're a worthy universal monster they look great yeah and the fact that not what i was expecting at all uh they actually make the mole people somewhat sympathetic yeah although they're horribly underused in this movie (laughs) i want mole people in a movie called mole people (laughs) And they have humps for no discernible reason. (laughs) Well, I mean, they have to uh, have some kind of competition for the beefy Metaluna mutant and other, like, C-grade universal monsters that they'll be running up against. And probably running into both Bud Abbott and Lou Costello in a later movie. Yeah. I can't think of anything else to say about the movie itself. Frank Baxter! We begin this episode with (laughs) a delightful, delightful intro. Uh, courtesy of one Frank C. Baxter. And I guess, would you call this a framing device? He doesn't come back to book in the movie in any way. And I'm disappointed that at no point was it revealed that he was just uh, telling this story to Fred Savage. I think it's still technically called a framing device, even if it doesn't book in the film, because it gives us another interpretive lens to understand it. And it's completely unnecessary. Yes. It doesn't contribute to what we're seeing at all. And the various hollow earth theories that he gives us don't have anything to do with what's on the screen. But he's so awesome. Like, usually <laughs> when you get these, like, old man talking heads in the 50s, they're just so dry. But he clearly is really enthusiastic about what he's talking about. And he has a great camera presence. Yeah, he kind of reminds me. Uh, but even even warmer than this, but he reminds me of the old Walt Disney intros for The Wonderful World of Color, a.k.a. The Wonderful World of Disney. I was thinking about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. He he has that kind of warm Disney vibe to him that isn't off-putting at all. It's just very welcoming. Yeah, because usually these kinds of framing devices and, you know, framing device or no, I think we can all agree that they're beautiful. Every framing device a painting, I say. But, uh, but this guy, I think, is sold. Like, Professor Baxter won me over by the fact that he sounds like a comical cartoon goose. He sounds vaguely like Rabbit from from Winnie the Pooh. It's a, it's, a, it's a voice you don't hear very often anymore. No, he has kind of like a Jimmy Stewart quality that I really enjoy. This is science fiction, of course. It's a fiction. It's a fable. It's a fabulous, funny freakout. 
but yes, he is he is kind of like adorable. But he he he's also, despite the fact that there's some like fun actors in this, and we'll get to that later, he has more presence than anybody on screen. Yeah. And I think it's because he seems to be the only one who's really enjoying his job. Yeah, exactly. He's actually really excited about these ideas, which nobody in the movie is. Yeah, and something that uh, that I am delighted to discover is that apparently he was showing up on a bunch of television specials uh, that, were, that were called the Bell System Science Series, where he was, <laughs> his character name, Beth, what do you think? What do you think they named him for this uh, for this show where he would be again just discussing very basic scientific concepts as a way to introduce it to children? Uh if it if it has to do with bell, hmm. So phones, doctor, doctor payphone? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's uh that's what that was the name of the uh failed American reboot of Doctor Who. <laughs> no, he was Doctor Research. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's adorable. Uh, I'm glad that he got more work beyond this. That's amazing. Yeah, and apparently he, um, this is only something I, I'm gleaning from Wikipedia now, but he also uh, hosted a, a TV series called The Four Winds to Adventure. Okay, <laughs> this guy keeps getting better and better. Yeah, it sounds like he has a, he had a real, a really great career. And uh, he apparently won the inaugural Golden Gavel at uh, the Toastmasters International. And he has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Holy cow. Whoa. Less interesting are the hollow earth theories that he was spouting out. That's true. They they left me with an empty feeling, but I I can't think of a word to describe it. (laughs) What I did find interesting is uh, we often think of these kinds of conspiracy theories about the world we live in being completely different from what we expect. These pseudoscientific conspiracy theories as being relatively recent, but as long as people have understood the earth to be spherical, uh, they've assumed that it could be hollow. Mm. Yeah, I, I think a, a lot of our listeners will be uh, familiar with the uh, picture from the History Channel being used as an image macro, uh, the host of the show Ancient Aliens, who incidentally is actually the host of This Is Your Mixtape, Michael Collins, uh, with his <laughs> wild hair holding his arms akimbo with the caption, Aliens. The first person who put something forward was, uh, let me look at his name, Edmund Haley, so the, the founder of Haley's Comet. I believe he hunted down the comet to extinction. Well, it just shows that, you know, back in the day, the line between science and pseudoscience was pretty thin. I mean, you can see that. He's just like, yeah, well, I found this comet, and also the Earth is made up of concentric circles, and each one has its own atmosphere. Not to mention, you know, our, our back then, our collective mental illnesses, Beth, would have been blamed on goblins, gremlins, ghoulies, critters, and possibly a Mac and me. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, though. Like, these hollow Earth theories are only coming out after the Enlightenment, right? So they're still trying to work within this idea of what is scientifically possible, Hmm. but not probable. Do you think the drive for that is an actual scientific theory, a belief, or just a desire to find a lost civilization? There's a Vice article that talks about the hollow Earth people, and the author's quite charmed by them because he's like, you know, these kinds of uh, conspiracy theories kind of appeal to your inner child as opposed to your inner monster. I don't know. The only things that appeal to me appeal to my inner monster. <laughs> and it was actually, it had a really funny, uh, really funny kind of sad story about how the hollow earth people online are being edged out by the flat earth people, <laughs> which seems completely lopsided to me. <laughs> what about the lopsided earth people, though? <laughs> how do they feel? I'm going to jump in here and point out that Edmund Halley argued that the Earth might be hollow for entirely scientific reasons. He, well, the name of his article was An Account of the Cause of the Change of the Variation of the Magnetic Needle uh-huh. with a Hypothesis of the Structure of the Internal Parts of the Earth. He was getting magnetic readings that weren't lining up with what the theories of the day should have said that they would. So we proposed a theory as to why that might be the case, that eventually got tested and there were other reasons why it was wrong but it was a perfectly scientific hypothesis to put out there well that, that's a good way of putting it that like they based these uh theories on working science of the day it's kind of like how one of my favorite books the time machine uh the assumption was that the sun would eventually go cold because mm-hmm. it would just run out of fuel because they didn't have an idea of of nuclear fission yet right so they just based it on what they knew about uh, heat death yeah, and, and thermodynamics. 
So that kind of makes sense. What, so it's interesting that what happens later is that hollow earth theories become less and less scientific and more and more biblical, oddly. Uh, there's basically a, a running theory that the people in the hollow earth are the 12th Jewish tribe. I don't know if you know about that theory. Oh, uh, yes. Didn't they use that for the, and I'm not kidding, didn't they use that for the basis of the original Battlestar Galactica? <laughs> I really don't like that series. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know the new one. I only know the old one with Lord Green and stuff. Or the idea that there's another Earth and a sun inside of the Earth. Because of the problem with the hollow Earth is that how, you can't account for the way gravity works. Because you need, you need the Earth to be solid for it to be creating the kind of gravity force it does, right? Mm. So I guess one way to solve that is just to put another Earth and another sun inside. However, like, you know, if there was a hollow Earth, and in fact, if we just lived in the center of the Earth, how cool would it be to just, you know, run up to the ceiling or dome, basically the end of it, and say, for the world is hollow, for I have touched the sky. (laughs) There'd probably be a lineup to say such a thing. I guess, in some ways, the hollow Earth is kind of like a Dyson sphere. Yeah, it, it totally is. Which means what? We're going to find C. Montgomery Scott in a, uh, <laughs> a transporter because he was looking for one? <laughs> one can only hope. It was Earth all along. <laughs> uh, one thing, uh, did, have you heard about uh, a fellow by the name of Admiral Richard Byrd, Beth? No, I have not. Okay, World War One aviator, and uh, he claimed that uh, his travels to the North Pole, he witnessed a lush green area which led directly to the center of the earth. That was uh, this hole that went straight down, uh, which he apparently saw from his plane. Uh, other theories from one Admiral Richard Bird include, uh, my uncle works at Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what if you played a video game cartridge of Sonic where Sonic wasn't a nice guy? <laughs> Uh, I'm also tickled by the fact, uh, and this is just the Newfoundlander in me, Beth, but I'm tickled by the fact that technically uh, his name is Admiral Dicky Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for finding that, Adam. I try. I think all three of us, being uh, English majors of of, of various stripes, uh, got pretty excited when the Epic of Gilgamesh was mentioned because it is a really fun story. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, guys! Can can I do the summary? I never get to do the summaries. Really, can I do the summary of Gilgamesh? I mean, well. In light of your many crimes against nature, I have no choice but to allow this. <laughs> Awesome. Picture it. Mesopotamia, 2000 BC. Gilgamesh is king of Uruk. Shamash, the glorious sun, made Gilgamesh beautiful. Adad, the god of the storm, made him brave. He's traveled the world, started a bunch of fights, and he's never lost. So, when he gets back to Uruk, what does Gilgamesh do? 24-7 fighting with dudes and sleeping with ladies on their wedding nights. Ah, Classy. (laughs) So yeah, no one has time for this. Even the gods are like, give this guy a hobby, distract him, something. So, one of them creates... Enkidu, a pretty little slice of yum, dropped into the wilderness. Enkidu hangs out with the animals, playing and frolicking and saving them from trappers. So this makes the trappers complain to Gilgamesh. And so Gilgamesh gives them the obvious solution. Hire a prostitute. Have her seduce Enkidu. Okay, sure. So the prostitute hangs out by a lake all naked and such. And Enkidu is like, okie dokie. And for six days and seven nights, they f***. Enkidu finally gets enough, but now he smells weird and the animals don't want to be his friends anymore. So the prostitute offers to take him to meet Gilgamesh. But Gilgamesh is busy. He's about to crash another wedding night. Enkidu hears this and is all like, nope. And he stands in the entrance to block Gilgamesh from accessing his... Mm -hmm. Gil arrives, sees Enkidu, and starts to wrestle with him. But as so often happens, at least in movies, their wrestling turns to loving. Gilgamesh realizes that he feels drawn to Enkidu, quote, as though to a woman. I'm not quoting the Babylonian or Assyrian, but that's that's a trans. Anyway, fade to black. Gilgamesh and Enkidu then have lots and lots of adventures together. And then one day, the goddess of love and war, Ishtar, asks Gilgamesh to marry her and, you know, fuck her so she can have some hot Gilga babies. Gil is like, hey, I would, but all your exes agree, you're crazy. He lists a bunch of them off. It's a terrible scene. She gets upset and tells the gods to kill both of them, Gil and Enkidu. They decide to just kill Enkidu, who gets sick and dies after like like two weeks of awful pain. 
And so Gilgamesh becomes very sad and very angry. And Gil sets out to find the secret of eternal life, and he enters a mountain, and he meets up with Shamash the god, who says, eh, I don't know about finding the eternal life. That's probably not a good plan. And I think that's the part that's relevant to the mole people. Hmm. But anyway, he keeps wandering the earth looking for the secret of eternal life without much luck. But finally, he meets a guy, a guy who is living eternally, who tells him a story uh, about how he was trapped in this great flood. That sounds an awful lot like the flood that Noah built the ark for. But he learns that all men are, except for this one guy, are mortal. But in fact, you can gain everlasting life through fame. And so he builds a bunch of great works in the city of Uruk and commissions a sexy epic. And sure enough, 4,000 years later, he and his boy toy are still remembered and mentioned, even on small niche podcasts. Yeah, it's a, a wonderful story and had been rediscovered in the late 19th century, I believe, because I think the the epic was written on cuneiform tablets. So it is still being assembled to this day because some of the pieces are missing. I think only two thirds of the whole epic of Gilgamesh are currently intact. And so it, it is still unfolding as as a masterpiece of literature. And also something uh, super interesting, there's a, we'll have a link in the show notes for this, there's a episode of a BBC4 series in which they're discussing the epic of Gilgamesh. And an interesting thing that is noted is that at no point uh, do uh, Gilgamesh and the wild man, whose name I'm now forgetting on for some Inkidu. reason. Inkidu. Inkidu. Right, right. Knuckles the Inkidu. Um, they... Uh, <laughs> They uh, they never refer to each other by name, and yeah. it's possible that if that occurs, it might be in some of these missing segments. Because that the only time that that's noted is uh, Enkidu's death. Uh, my favorite part is the fact that the prostitute not only gives Enkidu a different smell, but that it turns him into a man. That uh, that actually is what transforms him from an animal into a civilized human being who is no longer like the animals. I thought that is pretty uh, a pretty interesting reversal from what you would expect. Yeah, I mean, he just needed love and to straighten him out for seven days and seven nights. <laughs> also, and I think something that was really striking about this movie is not only do they, they reference the Epic of Gilgamesh and the ancient civilization of Samaria, which I think had become the new kind of it ancient civilization. <laughs> the hottest ancient civilization. <laughs> yeah. They, this really struck me that they, they suggest that the Great Flood is fact. Like it was an actual, an actual scientific fact that it happened. Because what was one of the most striking things about the Epic of Gilgamesh is that it referred to the Flood. Mm. Right, and so uh, the man who discovered it apparently was was so excited by this that he was reading them in the British Museum that he unclothed himself and ran around. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that's a different kind of night at the museum than you're used to seeing in your motion pictures. But yes, why is there no night in the museum based on that? Man goes naked from the thought that uh, the biblical flood uh, may be contradicted by this far older story or may have gotten inspiration from this far older story which i thought was was kind of a you know a sly move on, on the part of this movie because it kind of strengthened both sides right on the one hand you could say like here's the proof that this flood must have actually happened because it's being referred to across different civilizations right that felt like it was giving more evidence to the fact. Whereas other people were like, well, obviously the the myth of Noah was just a cribbing of this much older myth, and they just borrowed it and readapted it for their own uses. Uh, nobody was able to find definitive geological evidence. I think they found in the actual like fertile basin between the Tigris and the Euphrates that there might have been a flood in that area, which is maybe why this was a Babylonian myth, first and foremost. But there's no evidence of a worldwide flood. Although, from what, from my understanding of the Bible, Noah was not given immortality. So what was the point? You had to put up with a bunch of livestock on a boat for however long. You had to get two of every ant, I guess. Uh, well, there's yeah. It just the core was that the gods were mad about humans doing evil things, and in the case of the original. Sumerian myth, the idea that there were just too many humans and they needed to wipe them out. Mm. So it's just kind of that idea of there's being a check and then it's like a restart. And one thing I, I actually really like tying in with that is that there's a line, if memory serves, in uh, Gilgamesh where someone tries to dissuade 
uh, Gilgamesh from finding immortality simply by saying it's like, well, you know, God has made us to die and they've kept immortality for themselves. And I like the idea potentially that humans and human death is just a fun experiment that's unfolding. <laughs> and, and the fact that uh, the the one human being who has immortality and his wife, Uda <laughs> Nepishti, he seems kind of miserable. He's stuck in the middle of literal nowhere. Like there's no description of where he lives. It seems like some sort of like, like blank zone. And that is just his life forever. You know, it doesn't look like something you would actually want. Well, I mean, like, no matter how many things that you had, I mean, would you want eternal life? No. Vampire stories have have pretty much convinced me that it's not a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I want to be a vampire. Don't get me wrong. I just don't want to live forever. I want to, like, (laughs) I want to be a vampire who, you know, gets old and, you know, hair starts to fall out and one of my teeth get, get... gets chipped perhaps and you know i die of rheumatism or something you you, you don't want to live forever nobody does <laughs> what's so good about it you like okay imagine how out of touch you feel now at the raw old age of 35 Beth. <laughs> it's pretty old if you were 3500 yes you may have mala good looks but <laughs> at what cost <laughs> I mean, the youth music sounds so horrible to you now. Imagine mm. what it would sound with the removal of centuries. Uh, I see where you're getting to. Yeah. yeah. Die young, kids. But yeah, like, I, I don't know. I find I find Mesopotamia super interesting. I, I, I wish I knew more about it, but I guess there's also uh, a number of archaeologists who wish they knew more about it. <laughs> but there's a lot of interesting things. And like, for one thing, they're... A lot of early uses of like weaponry is coming from them. They apparently I- I invented the wheel and not Fred Flintstone, which I was led to believe. <laughs> they invented uh, the twelve, the do uh, what's it called? The sex, the sorry, the sexagesimal system. Yeah, sexagesimal system, base sixty. And now, Beth, I, I don't know if you ever watched This Ain't Reboot, a triple X parody, but my favorite character was sexagesimal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the original Babylonian text. <laughs> It was just boot then. <laughs> so I did listen to the In Our Time episode about the Epic of Gilgamesh, and one of the saddest moments is one of the professors is like, we're learning so many things, but we're so badly funded. I think we might disappear as a discipline. <laughs> <laughs> he also had a Frank C. Baxter voice, but for a British person, and well, that made it extra sad. Yeah. Hey, everybody, it's time for the Shadow 13. You heard it here first, folks. It's the Shallow 13. 13 fun facts about both the mole people and this episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. The clock is ticking. Go, 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 Beth, go! Mole People is the third of five back-to-back black-and-white Universal B-movies riffed in Season 8. Further adding to the deja vu is the cast. John Agar and Nestor Paiva both starred in Revenge of the Creature at the top of the season. Agar co-starred with Hugh Beaumont in Season 2's Lost Continent. Alan Napier, playing the High Priest, is best remembered for playing Alfred, trusted butler to Bruce Wayne, played by the inimitable Adam West. West had already received the MST treatment in Season 6 with Zombie Nightmare. Why did Adal slash Adad have to die? She was originally scripted as escaping to the surface with her John Agar love interest, but Universal feared that a romance between the two, despite being played by two very Caucasian actors, would promote race mixing. The mole people masks were impossible to see through, so the mole performers were allowed to not wear masks if their heads weren't supposed to be in the shot. When the mole people bagnap the archaeologists, you were supposed to only be able to see their clawed hands. But when they grab a chin, whom Mike and the Bot Stub load, you can see an ordinary-looking face hover into the scene because they failed to frame it properly. Similarly, back when Pearl's son Clayton was running the bad movie experiments, he had mole people to serve him. Two, to be precise. They were Jerry and Sylvia. They were often played by Best Brains interns, wearing replicas of this movie's bug-eyed makeup. The characters were phased out in season three because it seemed too cruel to make anyone wear the hot, suffocating mole masks under studio lights. This isn't the first time the source of a Joel-era running gag would be shown in the sci-fi era. The show's penultimate episode before its Kickstarter renewal featured a short called A Case of Spring Fever. Fever starred Coily, an imp who caused all springs in the world to disappear when a hapless oaf badmouths the noble spring. 
This quintessential 50s short inspired many parodies, including Crow's Waffle Sprite from Viking Women and Bride of the Monster in seasons 3 and 4. The mole people also made an appearance in The Wild World of Batwoman in season 5, because the film uses stock footage from this one. Upon mention of the goddess Ishtar, Crow cries, The movie wasn't that bad. Ishtar, the 1987 musical comedy starring Warren Beatty, Isabella Johnny, and Dustin Hoffman, may or may not be that bad, but we've never met anyone who's ever seen it and lived. Ishtar was a critical and box office disaster, with the film's title becoming a punchline in the 80s. Director Elaine May didn't helm another film for 29 years. In the opening sketch, Crow falls from a literal mile-high meringue. His fall lasts 17 seconds. Given normal air resistance, such a fall should take about 20 seconds. So hey, not bad. Crow must be especially aerodynamic. This is the first, and really, before season 9, only episode of MST3K to have a celebrity cameo. Robert Smith! Not the mopester from The Cure, heavens no. This Robert Smith was a running back for the Minnesota Vikings throughout most of the 90s. And apparently, he footballed very well indeed. Here's Mike Nelson's thoughts on this special guest. Robert Smith is a gorgeous man, better than myself in nearly every way, I think. Chiseled from Florentine marble, smart as a whip, rich as Croesus, strong as bear, the ladies love him. By the way, mole people are totally real. Or at least it's a term that's used to describe people who live in the train tunnels underneath New York City. In the 90s, a few news articles and books made it seem like there were up to a thousand mole people in New York, but those numbers were almost certainly exaggerated. They're still interesting, and we'll put a few links in the show notes. This episode charted surprisingly high in the top 100 episodes as voted by fans for MST3K Season 11 Kickstarter, ranking at 66. Let's see where you rank it. Go to itsjustashow.com slash survey and tell us everything. And that's time. Beth, we do have a cameo here. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, it's a cameo that you or I would not have picked up on. Yeah. (laughs) Unless it was underlined (laughs) in the sci-fi equivalent of the Amazing Colossal Episode Guide that's currently archived on uh, Satellite News. We're Canadian and we're nerds. Yeah. No reason to know anybody in football. Beth... I, I, the only sport I exceeded at was soccer baseball. <laughs> Classic. Although, from what I understand, in Britain, they call it soccer. Anyway, that that having been said, like, did this stick out for you in any way, the use of a, of a hunk at the end of this episode? Uh, only in that I... <laughs> Were you uh, waving your hand in front of your neck going, who's that hunk? <laughs> No, I, I, I immediately was, am I supposed to know who that is? Is this one of the crew? I don't recognize him. On the other hand, I really liked Paul Shapelin in this episode. I thought he did a really good job as an annoying uh, underground dweller. <laughs> oh, yeah, that uh, that bit on the uh, on the mole people and in, in the satellite love living there, I think, is a really fun gag. Uh, yeah, the closing segment, I think, is really good. I guess... What I'm getting at here is how did you find this cameo in comparison to the really, I would say, far more distracting cameos of Will Wheaton and some lady I don't know in Reptilicus? I think the fact that he doesn't talk is really helpful because, you know, uh, if you bring someone in who isn't related to the show, they don't talk properly, if that makes sense. Like, they just, they kind of don't stick properly. So I think in that case... It was less jarring. What I found a little jarring is the idea of Pearl having kind of sexual <laughs> proclivities at all. <laughs> well, she did go on a date uh, in one of the season seven episodes, and Clayton apparently was not a fan of uh, the guy who insisted on being real buddy buddy with him <laughs> that she was dating. <laughs> I forgot that one. I always just thought that she got all of her rocks off on just power. <laughs> I kind of like that idea. Well, I mean, both are possible, Beth. I mean, who That's knows true. what Pearl Forrester likes in the bedroom? I'm sure it's very power-based. Well, I should mention, just out of uh, Ishtar, the goddess who is frequently mentioned in this, also known as uh, Isis. She has a, many, many names. <laughs> She's probably not using that these days for rebranding <laughs> purposes. Yeah. She is the goddess of uh, love and war. Or, in other words, sex and violence. So she's the most entertaining of goddesses. Indeed. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting to note because, yeah, Will Wheaton and I think she's from Flash Gordon. Uh, (laughs) Aaron Gray. There you go. She seems nice. Yeah, I'm sure she's a lovely person. I'm sure she gave the warmest hugs to everybody on set. And everyone has a nice anecdote about her. But Also, the sci-fi show that she was in was called Silver Spoons. (laughs) 
Ah, uh, yes, with the uh, young Alfonso Ribeiro. <laughs> yes. But yeah, like those two were distracting. And I don't have any uh, uh, personal hatred towards the boy, mm-hmm. but I don't want him showing up in Mystery Science Theater 3000. And I was wondering why that was. And I, and I, cause I felt the same way about other celebrity cameos in season 11, which we discussed, uh, in Star Crash and Reptilicus. And I think it's because, like, it is what you said, like, they don't gel. They don't know the rhythm of the show. And it's, it's difficult in a comedy to get someone who'll, uh, who'll fit. Like, not every guest star will work. And one of the things I liked about this is that all, <laughs> one, I don't think I'm being cruel when I say that no one at Best Brains could have played the part of Howard. <laughs> no, that's true. It's like, who's that? Did they get a new, like, key grip or something? Who's that guy? <laughs> wow, lighting designer Jeff Stonehouse is ripped. <laughs> like, that is not the case. And using it like this is totally fine. I like the idea of... If somebody wanted to be in this show, they would make an anonymous cameo, whereas kind of stopping the series so that Will Wheaton or Jerry Seinfeld can have a moment is like kind of distracting and off-putting. And it reminds me in a weird way uh, of when like things always felt a little bit off in, say, The Kids in the Hall, when all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's real women here, so they won't have anything funny to do. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I want Scott in a dress. In this movie, apparently, this ancient civilization has been sustaining itself on mushrooms and only mushrooms, <laughs> which Crow calls God's worthless vegetable. God's worthless vegetable, the mushroom. Which is weird. Like, I would think that a society that was totally kept afloat on mushrooms would be way more chill than these goddamn albinos. <laughs> and I would just be a bit of a pedant right now. They're not vegetables. And they're not even plants. <laughs> they're legumes, and we call it maize. <laughs> <laughs> fungi are their own kingdom they are separate from animals and they are separate from plants hmm. in fact a lot of people consider them to be closer to animals than plants and and closer to god than us so it used to be thought that they were just plants right because they they can't move they don't locomotive around or anything like that but they are what is known as heterotrophic which means that unlike plants they have to go and find their food they have to take in food they just can't make it themselves like with photosynthesis hmm. Which is also why eating a purely fungal-based diet, you will eventually die, because you're not actually taking in enough energy. This is why you need plants in your diet. Well, I mean, that would perhaps explain why this is such a low-energy movie. (laughs) Yeah, so fungi, they can actually move. Terrifying. (laughs) Tell me more. So most fungi have what is called uh, a mycelium. Uh, These are these threads that uh, make up most of the fungus, and they're always underground. And sometimes they'll pop up with with a mushroom or something like that. But they go looking for food, and if there's nothing in the area, that whole mycelial layer will just start to creep. So, in fact, with climate change... Uh, all the fungi in like a certain region of America, I believe, are moving north by a rate of seven kilometers a year. Whoa. I think I saw a movie based on this phenomena. It's called Matango, a.k.a. Attack of the Mushroom People, and it's terrific. It's uh, directed by Ishiro Hondo, who made the original Godzilla. And now picture this, Beth. You're on a luxury yacht, but you crash on a mysterious island, and giant fungoids start coming after you. Now, you can protect yourself on the boat, but, well, I mean, you're, you're with a, a bunch of untrustworthy characters. I mean, a skipper... A professor, uh, the list goes on. Now, worse comes to worse. These people were once human, and everyone on board starts experiencing fungal growths on their bodies. <laughs> it's a great movie, and uh, it might have the greatest trailer of all time, where the closing tagline of the Toho Japanese trailer was, Please look forward to Matango! <laughs> <laughs> Fungi or fungi, fungi, I think as they're they're called in uh, England, with their laboratories. Fungi, the science guy over here. <laughs> they can do some pretty freaky things. You've heard of, of course, the ant zombies. Yes. Oh God, it's horrifying. <laughs> There's a certain kind of fungus that will grow into an uh, an ant's head, and not only like takes over, but uh, brainwashes them to climb to the bo- top of a tree, fall out crawl up to a certain level where like the conditions are ideal for spores 
and then clamp down onto the leaf, which is something they don't normally do, and then just die there. Yeah, isn't that the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis? I think. Oh, nice. I googled it and tried, (laughs) which is actually going to be on my grave. Fungi are not just terrifying, they also are extremely useful. Steroids are made out of them, statins, they do a lot of really great things. Obviously, we would not have penicillin without fungus. Uh, Because yeasts are a kind of fungus, as are, like, molds. And apparently they might be our replacement for plastic. Because the mycelium, you can grow it to basically have, like, a a gluey kind of foamy substance. And people have been using it to make surfboards and packing materials. And eventually it might be able to allow us to get rid of plastic entirely if it catches on. And uh, I believe you're also a supporter of weird (laughs) weird mushroom drink. Kombucha. Yes, it is made out of a, a yeast. I think it, that is often called uh, mother, and you can grow other, like basically, <laughs> bacterial colonies from it. I don't know if it's a fungus or a bacteria. I have to check oh, that I thought, out. I thought yes. it was grown okay. from a mushroom. I, am I not correct? No, no. It's like a it's a colony of some kind. Ah, uh, and if if they call it mother, why don't they call the drink mother's milk? <laughs> oh, stop May it! I have mother's milk. Uh, speaking of disgusting things, I know our producer Chris is is an antagonist of the Mushroom Kingdom. Well, I'm I'm no Mario, but, <laughs> or I'm no I'm no Bowser. However you want that joke to go, yeah. Because you're a vegetarian, so I, I bet you probably get mushrooms thrown at you a lot. As like, well, you can eat this <laughs> from passersby. Mostly. Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a real wedding treat mm. to be given basically a mushroom on a dry bun. Is is that a euphemism? <laughs> if only. No, it's like they'll use portobellos as like a replacement for like a hamburger. Ugh, God, they're gross. Yeah, portobellos are pretty gross. All mushrooms are gross. What are you talking about? All mushrooms are great, and I am uh, I am shocked by this frankly shit take on shiitake. <laughs> right, that was a good one, but mushrooms are still not fit for consumption. Oh my God, but they, they're the greatest thing to make a gravy out of that isn't an animal. What else are you going to make a gravy out of? Nothing. Just brown sauce. Just pour brown sauce on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, man, brown sauce comes from mushrooms. It's one of the greatest people. We all know this. Although I will say yeast is good. I'm totally okay with yeast. Mm-hmm. And kombucha. I, I Mushrooms can just be very rubbery. Like, they can have a texture that I'm not a fan of. But I, I, I am a huge supporter of truffles and all the magic they can do to, to things. Truffles can do good things. Mm-hmm. I'm not a fan of the raw mushroom. Why, why would anyone eat those? Why do those come with vegetable platters? I don't understand. Just put some ranch on it, and it won't taste like dirt, I guess. But a cooked mushroom is delicious. And they get rubbery when they go bad. And that's when they start to get a weird fish smell. <laughs> By the way, Adam, uh, kombucha is known as tea mushroom or Manchurian mushroom, according to oh. no greater source than Wikipedia. <laughs> That's why you have to say a secret word to get it to work. <laughs> exactly. It's not made out of mushrooms. Oh. But... There is some connection. Anyway, yes, and there are hallucinogenic mushrooms. That's also probably what they're they're most known for. Mm-hmm. Which apparently you can find growing just out on people's lawns. Like it's it's something that does tend to grow wild in temperate climates. Please don't eat mushrooms off people's lawns though. That can be really <laughs> dangerous. I would never do that from I'd never do that in Toronto because literally every inch of this city is covered in dog urine. Yes, there's that. And besides, if you tried eating, like, a mushroom that's out on somebody's lawn, you're going to be fighting a raccoon for it. (laughs) Horrible. One thing of note is that at the very top of the episode, there is a reference to Shannon Lucid when uh, they see the uh, Universal International logo. Hey, the Earth from Shannon Lucid's point of view. Beth, are you familiar with Lucid? I am not. Oh, well, I thought this would be kind of nice since this is uh, technically the end of the first year of It's Just a Show. And our very first episode, we were talking all about Lady Astronauts. And what Lady Astronaut is more accomplished than Shannon Lucid, uh, who actually won the Congressional Space Medal of Honor in 1996. Space Medal of Honor, you say? Yes, I didn't know that was a thing, and I thought that, you know, if they're going to have a Space Medal, shouldn't it be the Space Congressional Space Medal of Space Honor? There are a couple <laughs> extra spaces in there. So what was she honored for specifically? In the, in the late 1970s, she joined NASA because there were anti-discrimination laws at the time, as cited on her Wikipedia page. Uh, 
And she got her Congressional Space Medal of Honor for her 179 days spent on the Mir Space Station, which, of course, was all the rage in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Much like grunge and the Spice Girls. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yes, I mean, another thing of note is that from 2002 to 2003, Lucid was the chief scientist of NASA. Oh, wow. That's pretty high up. Yeah. And she only retired in 2012. So, as a astronaut of note, uh, I figure it would be nice to uh, make note of Shannon Lucid in this podcast, if only briefly, given our talk of Lady Astronauts in our very first episode of It's Just a Show, when we talked about Rocket Ship XM. Uh, well, Chris, do we have a random question from our listeners? No, no, we don't this time. In fact, instead, we have three questions that we're asking our listeners. So tell them what they should do. For our anniversary, we would like our listeners to complete a survey, a three-question survey. It's not one of those horrible, like, 45-minute ones at itsjustashow.com slash survey. We'd love to hear about what you think about the show so far, which is basically which episode you liked best, which episode of MST3K you liked best, and one mystery question. Yes, so mystery guests, sign in, please, and... Put in your answers for that survey. There will be no prize for it. Do it out of the goodness of your heart. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you too love Frank C. Baxter, or if you'd like to ask Beth and Adam anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, or we're on Twitter at It Is Just a Show. We'd love to hear from you. A reminder, if you're going to be in Toronto on Saturday, March 24th, come to our party. Details are at megaphonic.fm slash party. Streamers will be available. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, as always, to all of our Patreon supporters. You can support It's Just a Show and access some superfan bonus bits from this episode and from many, many older episodes by going to itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today on It's Just a Show, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 24. Well, we've buried these mole people. (laughs) <laughs> and we've damned them with our words. Uh, Chris, what do we have to look forward to next time in light of this recent news about a survey? <laughs> okay, look, the whole thing about season eight is that it's broken into these little story arcs, and these first bunch of shows are all about Deep Ape. So we had thought, hey, let's do all the Deep Ape shows. What could go wrong? Anyway, our next episode will be our year in review spectacular, but after that, we'll wrap up this stretch of season eight with season eight, episode four, The Deadly Mantis. Oh, yay. It's another Universal Monster movie. And I had a far more terrifying uh, image of what the movie could be because I thought Chris said The Deadly Mantis. I have not seen about how much longer this goes on, but I have a feeling that Universal has a lot of monsters. As it happens, they have decades of monsters. <laughs> Beth, there is not one, but two, possibly 85 movies in which Bud Abbott and Luke Costello meet these monsters. <laughs> <laughs> now that I would watch. Yeah, yeah there, there was actually a tweet very, very long ago uh, in which this was actually championed as one of the highlights of the sci-fi era. I've never seen the episode. I like mantises. And also this season's on a bit of an upswing. So I'm really curious about how this episode's going to turn out. I'm getting a little bit tired of black and white rubber monsters, but eh, they are getting a little better. So I'll follow you in your optimism. This one's in color. Oh, my God. No, it's not. No, it's not. Those, co- those colors are <laughs> black and white. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Uh, it's not that I have anything against black and white, but, you know. It, it is a bit samey. It is a bit samey. Yeah. They're all shot in very similar ways. The music is quite similar. <laughs> yes. In fact, I believe Deadly Mantis joins the previous three movies, including The Mole People, for this episode, where uh, it's just a bunch of... Old stock cues, a couple of minutes of new music from the likes of William Lava, all supervised by Joseph Gershenson. Actually, this this movie was remarkable for not having a lot of music when you would expect there to be music. Will the Deadly Mantis be the same? Find out in a month. <laughs> so on that note, until next time, keep fit, have fun, and leave a nice looking corpse. Eat your mushrooms, but don't eat just mushrooms. Don't.
don't eat mushrooms. Until next time, Take It Away Theme Squad, featuring once again, Jessica Lockhart. Thank you.